Hi, thanks, MJ. Uh, appreciate the introduction. Again, my name is Jeff Delito. I'm the CEO of Revenue Health. Uh, Revenue Health is a company um, that designs revenue cycle solutions uh, to leverage your existing uh, practice management and billing systems. Uh, we automate manual tasks of analyzing your AR and managing your work plans for your staff uh, and helping you get optimal uh, cash collections for your practice or for your practice clients if you uh, work for a revenue cycle firm. I've been working in billing uh, for over 20 years now, uh, having worked for a number of firms uh, in Boston and outside of Providence, Rhode Island, and uh, have extensive experience uh, doing revenue cycle management for um, both large hospital and small private physicians offices, uh, as well as in the uh, community health space. I wanna talk to you briefly about our agenda today. Uh, the reason that we're on the call uh, is in a response to uh, the COVID-19 crisis that we're experiencing uh, around the world and to discuss how that's impacted uh, those of us who work in rev revenue cycle uh, in medical practices. And so we're going to talk a little bit about the situation um, and a response strategy uh, for dealing with the current situation. Um, we're going to talk to you today about preparing your team. Uh, for working remotely uh, where they may not have to have had work remotely before. In doing so, we're going to help you develop and uh, learn how to develop and maintain a plan of action for your team and track, act, uh, track your progress uh, in that plan so that you can prepare for the future. Uh, so it's my pleasure to introduce Deb Crimmins. Deb Crimmins uh, is the president of Crimmins and Associates Consulting and is bringing with her over 25 years uh, experience with leading large and diverse healthcare revenue cycle operations. And so with that, I'm going to hand it over to you, Deb, and um, you can tell us a little bit more about yourself and, and uh, what we're going to learn about today. All right. Thanks, Jeff. So good morning or good afternoon, everyone, depending on where you are today. Uh, I'm very happy to have this opportunity to share some thoughts and ideas on how to navigate through the unprecedented events that are occurring at this time. To start, I'd like to give you a Cliff Notes version of my background, which encompasses 25 years of experience leading large and diverse healthcare revenue cycle and operations teams for Fortune 500 companies and also in leading system implementations. In 2016, I founded Crimmins and Associates Consulting and have since been partnering with senior executives and private equity firms in many different specialties to create and execute on strategic plans that build the infrastructure required to support growth and to tactically improve key performance indicators. So now let's dive into this discussion by reviewing the current situation. So what are we seeing now? Um, first, the COVID-19 crisis has created a very dynamic and unpredictable shift in healthcare services performed and in the clinical and support workforce. This is so, I mean, we're living this, right? This is so dynamic that some of the predictions on the slide um, have already come to fruition and the timeline for emergency measures just continues to get extended. We know that revenue streams will be directly impacted or probably have already been impacted by reduced elective and non-emergency procedures and a reduced ability to collect on um, patient balances. Resources um, either will or most likely have already shifted from on-site to remote and FTE available hours um, will be reduced due to increased sick and family leave. Um, and in fact, just this morning, as of this morning, I read that 90% of the states have now issued stay-at-home guidelines. And last, provider resources who were previously assigned to revenue cycle functions and projects may be reassigned to support daily operations. You may already be feeling this. If you haven't, you, you may in the future, or if you're a practice, you're doing this. So, what I mean by this is that there are some, some resources that we count on daily for revenue cycle. For example, in the, you know, if, if you're working your denials and your denials management um, strategy, you know, a very common tactic for that is that, that you're working with either um, frontline people in, 
in the practices or in the hospitals or you're working with clinicians to A, to help resolve existing denials that you have or to, to work on um, you know, plans to be able to reduce the denials that you have. And I think it's just realistic to expect that those resources may not be available to you um, until we get through this crisis and then, and then potentially a little bit after that. So it's just being realistic about that. And then looking forward, I, I think we all need to prepare for a surge as, as routine um, and elective procedures are rescheduled. In fact, I, in the last month, I have rescheduled all of my routine dental and medical procedures to uh, mid-summer or late summer. Um, it, we have to anticipate that the, the percentage of that lost volume is gonna be recovered. Um, but that also means that we're going to need the staff to be able to hand, handle those additional um, visits or encounters that are coming through. So we just need to keep that in the back of our minds that, that even though things uh, may be slower in certain, in certain areas, um, at, when we get through this and, and when things start to get back to normal and people are catching up on things, the end of the year is probably going to be a surge in, in volumes that are higher than normal. Um, so now I'm going to turn it back over to Jeff to review some of the key components of the response strategy. Yeah, thanks, Deb. And I, I, I just think it's, um, you know, you're taken aback a little bit by how quickly things are moving and how quickly they have moved. Um, you know, we started putting this presentation together a couple of weeks ago, and we knew we had to put something together quickly. We did one last week, and this is our encore presentation. And so much has changed um, over the last three weeks. Um, and for us, uh, we started talking about this, um, uh, you know, this started to affect us in, in mid-March. I know that my last day in the office uh, was March 12th. Uh, my kids haven't been to school since the 13th. Um, and we have practices since then uh, that uh, use our software uh, to help automate some of their billing function. And uh, they've gone from none of their staff working remotely to all of their staff working remotely. Uh, and so the need for a response strategy is, is now more important than ever. Uh, and so throughout this presentation, shortly, uh, Deb, you're gonna talk to us a little bit more about understanding and mitigating the risk. And again, week to week, things are changing. So we, we've learned things uh, since last week uh, uh, that weren't true um, the week before. Uh, we want to give you uh, some tools to help prepare your staff to work remotely, uh, not just from an infrastructure and a reporting standpoint, but how do you make sure that your team can be optimally productive at home when they haven't had to do that before. Uh, we'll help you give you some tips on how to identify and prioritize their work and put a plan together. If you haven't been using sort of what we call intelligent prioritization for creating a work plan for your team to date, uh, it's really time that you start with that. And during this time and during this crisis, it's gonna be critical that you have a plan that you can measure and that you can review after that plan is completed. And then when we're done talking about that, um, we also wanna talk about um, not just preparing for what's happening right now, um, but also identifying uh, some uh, tips that you can use to uncover other existing revenue opportunities. Uh, and so with that, Deb, if you could uh, talk to us about risk a little bit, um, and we can help folks understand how to sort of mitigate and manage risk, uh, then we can come back to talking about how to plan and put that work plan together in future slides. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. So on this slide are some key steps to understand and mitigate the risk to the business. Um, the first, and I think this is really important, always, and it's especially important now, is to create visibility and manage risk for your specific business and your specific situation. So, you know, depending on what your business is, the, the, the degree of, of risk and impact is, is going to be different, so you really need to take that into consideration. But this is the time to have transparency within your leadership teams, with your frontline teams, and with your business partners. And to make sure that you're taking your unique situations into consideration, when developing your go forward plan. And I, I have a few actions that I would recommend in, in for you to think about as, as you're putting that plan together. So the first is to assess and prioritize your risk by creating a risk mitigation plan. 
And you know, what do I what do I mean about that? You know, what is a risk mitigation plan? Um, it's a tool that can be utilized to understand what's more, most important to protect in your business, to define the key risks that could have negative, negative impacts on those things, and to create visibility and a plan to track those potential disruptors and to address them quickly, and I emphasize the word quickly. Um, the second recommended action is to garner buy-in from key leaders and influences, influencers to execute on the plan. And I, probably some of these leaders that I'm talking about are actually on the phone right now with us. Um, but we know that leaders, I put will be, but we're, we're all dist distracted right now. And so it's critical to have leadership commitment to dedicate time and resources to monitoring those key risk factors and implementing corrective actions as indicated. So everyone's gonna be distracted, but we need to have that buy-in and, and to be able to uh, schedule, whether it's daily or weekly, um, schedule time with these key people in the organization and to, to review the metrics and to talk about them and to talk about action plans and then follow up on, on those plans. You know, is it being done, isn't it being done? How do you course correct? Um, getting that scheduled is, is, and getting the commitment for people to, to be on those, in those discussions and on those calls is, is critically important to this. And then track and monitor performance to plan. Um, and Jeff's going to talk about, give us some tools and talk about that a lot later, but it's, it's really important to have the historical trended information and then also real-time data so that you can bump up your, what's happening today to what has happened historically so you can quickly identify any performance gaps and, and, and address them. Um, on the bottom section, I just wanted to give you a, a really quick and simple way to quantify your potential revenue or cash losses. So um, DSO is your day sales outstanding. This is the amount of time from when, you, when a service is performed to when the cash is posted, right? So you collect and post the cash. Um, so in this example, we have monthly expected revenue of $100,000. We expect that there's going to be a 20% reduction in, in that revenue. The normal collection rate historical has been 95% and the projected cash reduction therefore would be $18,000. And over on the side in the example I have, if your, if your DSO is 30 days, um, an $18,000 reduction in cash should be assumed for the month following the impacted period if no mitigation is implemented. So if you, if you, if you, do, if you do nothing else and, and all that's happening you know, to you right now is that you just have a loss in encounters and in visits, then you, sh you would expect to see an $18,000 reduction. Um, so this is just a way to kind of quantify this and, and also a way to, um, when I was talking about that leadership support, to try and get people's attention that this is really important and, and it's time well spent if people are spending time on, on this plan. So on the next page, I just have some other recommendations on, on some steps to, to, to look at to try and mitigate your risk. So the first is to stay current on policy changes. Um, to remain compliant and then also just to understand, you know, what are those changes and, and how do they affect your business? And what I re would recommend on this is don't assume that someone is doing this or that other people are doing this. I think the, the, the best way to do it is to make sure that someone or some group of people are responsible and accountable for monitoring um, the, the policy changes. And so this was, this is, you know, making sure that you're up on what's happening with CMS. Um, CMS publishes Medicare Learning Network guides, um, and they just last week published one for telemedicine and telehealth, which had the most current, of course they've changed again, but it had the most current guidelines from CMS on telemedicine. So that's a great resource to go to. Um, specialty association websites. So one of, one of my clients is, um, is a radiology group. And so I would recommend to them is that they, uh, they are tied into the American College of Radiology website because that website is very attuned to what is happening today and any regulatory or, or changes that are happening that impact their business. 
The second bullet is to keep your eye on the ball and expect process gaps due to disruptors. And what I mean by this is um, don't assume that because you haven't had a problem in an area historically that you're not going to have a problem with it going forward. Right. So just expect that you're going to have gaps and and make sure that you're monitoring all of those key indicators. Third, utilize system reporting to track and monitor uh, work performed. This, could, this is productivity, timeliness, quality. Um, once again, Jeff is going to talk about this and in, in more in a minute, but um, you know, critically important to have this visibility. And then also to, to understand if, if there's something that's very a key indicator that's very important for you to be tracking right now. Um, if you can't get it electronically, then you may have to create manual reporting, which is is you know not the best case scenario, but but manual is better than nothing. So so I, I would I would definitely recommend that that you um, use every everything every tool <laughs> that you have available to you to monitor uh, and track work performed. Um, back to basics. This is just once again, looking at performance indicators and, and metrics to make sure that your, your cash flow is, is going to be as, as robust as it possibly can be. And one of the, the most important things and one of the areas that I see so many organizations fall down on is, is like once again, back to, back to basics and, and simple, but it's in claims management. And I would recommend if you haven't already that you create revised processes and work assignments to make sure your claims are getting into the payer system for adjudication. And also critically important is that you create a backup plan. So if key staff who are assigned to do different um, tasks within this claims management process, um, if they're out, they, first of all, you know that and that you have someone else who is a backup who's gonna be able to pick up and, and pick up on those, those tasks and processes to make sure your claims get out the door. So now um, Jeff is gonna expand on how to deploy strategies to manage a remote workforce. Yeah, thanks Deb. And, and a lot of really, really important tips in there in terms of mitigating risk. I think the most important thing I heard you say or one, one of the keys that I took away from that uh, was making sure that leadership in your organization understands the financial impact. It's, it's no different than uh, back when we all had to start doing uh, HIPAA compliance and we had to go back to leadership to explain, um, you know, what things had a high probability of happening and would have a high impact that we'd have to address, even though, though they weren't all, always revenue generating activities. So appreciate all those points. Um, I'd said earlier that, you know, we, we've made this immediate shift to a remote workforce. At, at Revenue Health, you know, we're uh, we're a revenue cycle and software company, so we already had a large portion of our staff working remotely, and we had the infrastructure to handle that. Part of that infrastructure has to do with um, policies. Uh, and so um, in 2019, there were a couple studies done. One had said that about 43% of the American workforce was capable of working from home and working from home at some capacity, maybe a day or a week, if not more. Uh, and they interviewed thousands of um, uh, employees who reported that they were working from home. And I thought it was funny that healthcare had the highest percentage of employees, 15.4% of the employees are work, were working from home. So even if you're at the tops of these, you had 40% of your, your uh, team working remotely um, or uh, numbers that were higher, immediately again, we've moved to 100%, which can be jarring uh, for the organization. Uh, so there's some some things you need to do to prepare your staff to work remotely. Uh, the first thing you're going to need, if you don't already have them, if you weren't prepared for 100% of your staff is you're gonna, uh, to work remotely, is you're gonna need the, infrastructure, uh, the IT infrastructure and policies to handle that. Um, you're going to need to make sure that your clients can access your, your uh, systems remotely and securely. Uh, within HIPAA compliance, you're going to need to offer them training and support. Some of them may have never connected uh, to a, a remote VPN or a Citrix web page. Uh, they may not have the equipment at home, uh, and so you may have to come up with plans to how you get your team compliant, secure equipment. Uh, you may have to implement web conferencing, and if you have team members who are answering maybe patient calls or other calls, you're going to need a way to field those calls or at least field the messages. 
Um, and password management is going to be important. Uh, people are used to being at work and they may have whatever tools for managing their passwords, whether, it, whether it's a, a password vault or, or some sort of a, a access integration, but uh, they're going to need those uh, things even more when they go remote. Um, and in, importantly, what they're going to need is support from your IT team. Uh, so it's important um, as you work on your remote staff work, uh, your remote work staff strategy, um, that recognition for your team is given often every time you can and your IT team is probably pretty burdened right now uh, with getting people set up I know um, Deb you said you had some experience with this with some of your clients and I you know had some really relatable experiences here yeah I, I, I do Jeff and and you know I have a great ex a example of that and and this is what I was referring to earlier when I spoke about keeping your eye on the ball um, Recently, I, I discovered a situation where a teammate had shifted to remote work and she was embarrassed to tell anyone that she couldn't access VPN. And this resulted in over a week of lost productivity. And if her, if her leaders had been proactive and assumed that this training would be needed and had, had assured staff that it was safe to ask for help and then also made sure that that help was available um, through the IT department or whatever resources they had to, this lost productivity wouldn't have occurred. So I just wanted to, to share that. That's, that's a pretty common situation where people are just, they, they, they feel like they should know and they're, they're afraid to raise their hand and say they can't, you know, they can't do certain things to access. And um, I think just giving them that assurance that, hey, we're, we, we understand this is new, we understand there can be hiccups, and here are the resources that, that you can go to. Um, that could alleviate some of these lost productivity situations and a lot of anxiety on the, on the part of the teammates. Yeah, thanks for that. I mean, that's, it's, it's really important to make sure that people at least functionally can get in to do their work um, and that they feel like they have those um, open lanes of communication. And so that's a, a good segue into talking about the human resources needs. Uh, so human resources is going to play a critical role in this, whether you've outsourced, maybe use a a company like ADP or you have another outsourced human resources firm or you're, you're doing the human resource, the HR work, um, but having uh, updating your policies is going to be critical. If you don't already have a remote work policy, now's the time to be uh, crafting one of those and going out and uh, talking to your HR team about getting a, a remote work policy to your team. Um, that's not the same as a HIPAA um, compliance policy. We'll talk about that in a minute. Um, you also want to make sure that employees are clear about uh, time tracking and that they understand your policies for PTO and, and other things, and, and maybe even family medical leave, uh, because people, uh, unfortunately, are going to be sick, and they may need to take care of a family member, uh, or they may get sick. So they're going to need to understand how, those, how they get access to those benefits and what those policies are. Um, and then human resources can play a huge role in employee and manager check-ins. You know, my role as the COO at Revenue Health, I get a call from a member on the HR team asking me how I'm doing. And it's nice to be able to talk to somebody who's not a coworker or an employee, uh, you know, because I'm trying to be as optimistic as I can um, with our team. Uh, but sometimes I need somebody to talk to as well. So just that ability to talk openly um, is a critical role uh, that your human resources team can play. In addition to that, you need to make sure you've pardoned some of your HIPAA compliance documentation. Uh, you need a remote work policy for your team, and that thing needs to make sure that policy needs to make sure that that those team members are aware of things like um, not working uh, with their monitor in public view. Um, they need to be aware of how they discuss confidential information and that they have mechanisms for either using a secure device that you've provided to them or that they have a secure way to connect to you, which means virus protection systems have to be up to date. And you may need to audit those things. So you may need to have your IT team give you a plan for how you validate that the people who are connecting to you are doing so securely. Um, and so there's other things that were sort of normal in the office, but now you're not in the office anymore, such as saving, uh, you know, or printing confidential information. You want to prohibit your team from printing things at home um, or taking any paper home with them. Maybe they're coming in one week to the office uh, and you have scanners and there's things that you can scan to store that information on your network. You want to try to engage as many as though of those as you can. You know, HIPAA compliance may be loosened, and I use this um, carefully, 
for the practices, but it is not going to be loosened for business associates such as billing, uh, such as billing companies and revenue cycle firms. So it's important that these policies stay tight. So your staff is remote. They've got a computer that they can connect. They've got you know a way to connect with you um, via audio. Uh, you've updated your remote work policy. You've updated your remote work policy for HIPAA compliance, and now your team is is ready to go. So what else? What other strategies can you employ? Maybe the one of the top strategies you need to employ quickly is a po just an overarching uh, culture of uh, over communication. Uh, and so there's ways that you can help communication when everybody's remote. We've all kind of seen it, I think, now. Um, everybody having uh, web calls with their family members. You know, I, I got, a, got to see, you know, a good friend of ours. They're expecting a, a, new, a new baby, and they did the gender reveal for us. So we got to see all that, and a lot of our family and friends were there uh, remotely. Uh, so use daily check-ins using video conferencing solutions like Zoom or WebEx. If people have security concerns about Zoom, uh, it's important to know that they just came out with an update to their software last week. So if you didn't apply an update to Zoom, you need to. And it does things like not permitting people to join your um, meeting without the meeting ID or, or password, I mean. And it also requires a meeting password on every, uh, on every meeting. So Zoom has exploded in use. It's being used by schools. My kids use it. Um, and they're doing things to, to secure uh, their system, but whether it be Zoom, WebEx, Microsoft Teams is another amazing tool. I believe you can get Microsoft Teams for free um, for a short period of time, and you can do video conferencing uh, and web conferencing in Teams. It's really very useful. Um, we're not using video here because of the webinar format, but uh, video on culture is huge. To be able to see each other, see when someone is maybe tilting their head to the side, you know, call it the dog head tilt, right? They don't really understand what you're saying. Um, and, and that can really uh, tear down some communication barriers. And communicate uh, company updates frequently. Make sure your team knows what's going on with the company. Make sure that they're, you know, it, it can be really uh, tough to be at home and not know, not know what's going on. And folks tend to make things up in the silence that aren't true. So you want to keep company updates coming uh, frequent, but you want them to be coming informal unless they need to be formal. Uh, try to keep them. Uh, coming. Um, and with that, if you're going to have meetings, just remember that folks don't have the water cooler and the coffee maker and the copier to stand around talking about whatever show they're binging on Netflix or, you know, whatever the social media, you know, funny meme of the day is. So try to keep check-ins light. You know, we try to allow for a few minutes at the every, beginning of every meeting just to let people talk. Uh, they're locked in their houses, maybe alone, maybe with their kids, maybe with their pets. Um, and so a little bit of that engagement, that personal engagement is going to help productivity. Um, and so that's part of uh, preventing burnout, too. You want to you want to help your team avoid burnout because uh, they can't get away from work anymore if they're working from home. Uh, do a weekly spotlight on an employee. Um, maybe have them share pictures of their home office. Um, we did a, at our office, we did a thing with um, your favorite hat to wear while you're working because typically we don't have people wearing hats in the office. Have people send pictures or let their pet sit in on these video calls. Whatever they can do uh, to make it, um, to lighten things up um, is really going to help them focus when it's time to focus. And then when it is time to focus, help your team create daily work plans to keep them productive. You need to start with an overarching plan but we know anything you need to do needs to start with a plan in order for it to succeed. Uh, so we're going to show you some ways in our tool and our software that you can create that plan and, and just frame for that other ways you can do it even on your own, even manually. Um, but there are tools out there. Uh, we use a software called Monday.com. It's on the left side of your screen. You can see on the very left, there's a menu of all these different boards. And, and one of them near the bottom is even called Jeff's task list. So that's where I keep my tasks so everybody knows um, where my priorities are in the organization and everybody can see them. Uh, this is a client uh, dash dashboard for us so we can see what are the daily and weekly tasks that we need to get done. We've been using this for a couple of years now. I actually saw an ad for this on social media and decided to try it out. It's been really, really great for our team. We can see if somebody's working on it, if it's done, if it's not done, it's a great tool. There's other tools out there such as Trello T-R-E-L-L-O, Trello.com. And Microsoft has some task management things too. If you get into that free Teams offer, uh, you can see some things there uh, that you could definitely put to use. 
And again, if software uh, isn't where you want to go, you don't want to go through the process of um, setting up one of these tools on the right side, you can see a template, just a Microsoft Word or Excel template. But let somebody put a plan together for their day or for their week. What am I going to work on? What do I expect to accomplish today? Your team ought to be able to tell you at the end of this week or at the beginning of next week, what are they going to accomplish for the week? And then they could come back at the end of the week and tell you, well, here's what I accomplished. Here's what I didn't accomplish. And here's why. Uh, we do that. We have uh, meetings like that, and we've been doing it for a long time, twice weekly, Monday and Friday. On Friday, we get together and talk about what was finished so we can queue up priorities for the next week. And on Monday, we talk about, you know, major theory conversations around those priorities. So if somebody is starting to develop their own work plans, or maybe you can help template them out, they're going to be the most productive if they sit down at their computer with a plan of what they're going to accomplish that week or that day. <clears throat> and again, in terms of that over-communication, so those working on those plans together, helping your team members put those plans together where maybe they haven't, maybe reports were brought to them in their cubicle or to their desk and they just got their work as their reports were produced and now they need a little help uh, managing that. This is a great opportunity for managers to be checking in on team members directly whenever possible. And, you know, just like your HR department is do may be doing this, it's also a great time to pick up the phone and call somebody and just say, how are you? You need to be aware of what's going on inside uh, somebody's home, which is now their office, their remote office. You need to be a, a understanding of the environment. They may not tell you everything that's going on in their personal life, but to call them up and ask them how they're doing um, and, and in terms of keeping with their work, are they having any problems so that you're aware of now where all of your satellite offices are, those are all working at peak performance. Again, I talked about chat products such as Teams, Slack, Convo is another one of them. And again, don't be afraid to pick up the phone. And this is also a great opportunity uh, to get your staff engaged with each other. Uh, you may have staff, we're going to show you some productivity and outcomes reporting that our system generates, where you can identify who's really performing well. If you're not tracking your team, you can't. But if you are tracking your team, you can start to see, wow, this person's doing really well. You know, I'm going to get MJ uh, to work with Jeff, because Jeff's falling behind a little bit, and MJ seems to be exceeding um, our expectations. So it all starts with a plan. So when we talk about a plan, so what we're trying to create a plan to do is collect as much cash as we can when there's been a downturn in business. And so, <clears throat> pardon me. So as we are creating that plan, uh, one of the most critical pieces of data that you need to collect are some totals around your claim inventory. A lot of people, when they look at their accounts receivable, their, some may call it an ATB or the age trial balance, or they're just AR aging, they're looking at buckets of cash. Um, but if you're talking about productivity, and one of the things that our system does is it, it compiles claims into inventories. And so on screen, in the screen here in the, in the top table, you can see that there's 20, almost 21,000 claims to get worked. But if I don't know there's 21,000 claims to get worked and I only have one biller, I don't know whether or not that one biller could keep up with 20,000 claims that are already in the system to get worked. And when I start to take a look at that inventory, it's critical to identify AR pockets that you can address right now. What are claims that have gone, what are the claims that went out at the end of February that should have paid? Because again, we all know if you work in billing, the farther away you get from the data service, the more difficult it gets to, and more expensive it is to collect on that money. So if the claim went out and didn't have a response on it in 45 days, for example, which is, I mean, this thing's been going on for about 30, 45 days now, um, what's going on with those claims? Maybe it's not time to be looking at stuff that's over two years old that's been sitting on the AR. Um, it's also critical time, especially as we're making a shift to telemedicine and remote medicine, um, to start tracking denials and denied claims as soon as they're coming in. The reason for that is if 30, 60, 90 days we get back to being in the office, those resources that Deb had talked about uh, start to become available to us we need to make sure that we get to them as soon as possible. If there's things that the provider needed to look at in the chart so that you could correct some billing, and maybe that pro provider was furloughed, 
you're going to need to be able to hit that provider up for that information as soon as they get back. And then again, identifying uh, trends in uh, new denial trends and such as telemedicine or remote health is going to help you understand how to manage those things going forward and to keep those things from becoming pockets of AR that are difficult to work in the future. So it starts with getting an inventory of claims, whether you're running it out to a spreadsheet, which is the manual way to do it, whether or not you have a piece of a report in your practice management system or you're using a system like ours, uh, understanding the volume of claims that are out there to get worked is, is the place to start. So then once you've identified claims, uh, it becomes even more critical than it ever has to prioritize high yield claims. So just like you, when mitigating risk and things that, are, that have a high risk, a high impact, but also have a high probability have the highest risk factor. And so you wanna almost have a reverse risk factor or develop a yield factor to say, which of my claims, if I was to work them today, would get us our practice the most money in the door today. And so on this screen, you can see the left arrow, there's an accounts receivable with 9,653 claims on it. They're about $2.2 .2 million. And I've got this big arrow pointing at the claims that are $1,000 and over. And there's 181 of those. And working those 181 claims would yield us $433,000. So we want to make sure our team is working those claims now. Uh, and we definitely want to make sure our, claim, our team isn't working the thousands of claims in the $5 to $49 range that are only going to get us $43,000. So that's what it means about prioritizing high yield claims. Now, high yield claims doesn't always just mean high balance. That high yield is a, is a identification of what claims are out there that I, connect, I can collect the quickest, and of those, which are gonna yield the most cash for the practice. And then once you've developed your work plan, you need to uh, distribute and allocate that work to your team. So once you know how many thousands of claims you, you have, you may uh, need to start allocating those differently. Perhaps you used to have somebody who just used to work Medicaid and they used to work all the Medicaid claims. But now that you're prioritizing them to the subset of just that one payer, maybe you need to be having them take on other work that they may not have been taking on before. So when you create a work plan, whether that's a weekly or a daily work plan to get to these claims and you give it out to your team, you can't track them if you don't know how many you gave out to them. So when you distribute your, your list, that's your baseline. You know that you gave whoever you had assigned to work your claims that were approaching critical filing limits. On this screenshot, it's 116 claims. If I handed those claims to MJ, he needs to be prepared to do whatever he needs to do to report back to me what happened to those 116 claims. Um, our system, and again, the screenshots that we're showing, you know, we've got access to, to show you things out of the Revenue Health tool. We automate the creation of these work plans. Uh, our systems go through and chug through and identify what are these highest priority claims by connecting to your clearinghouse and your practice management system. We use the software that you're already using uh, to help do that for you. But again, if you're doing this, those are the places you need to be thinking about that. Um, and then you may need to make decisions about how you prioritize critical claims that will become loss revenue. Again, do you want to be working on claims that had hit a filing limit or maybe a year or so over a filing limit? Maybe not but you definitely want to be looking at things that are coming up on a filing limit um, soon, you know, next week or two. Um, and then lastly, creating this type of work plan, if you've never used this type of planning or tracking in your practice before, um, will help you create redundancy. On a system like ours, if somebody's, uh, if, you know, if MJ's uh, working or Pat is working the, the dental work list and they have to be out for a day, you, somebody else can just pick up that work list and you haven't lost the work. So it starts with the manager, it starts with the manager having this data, whether they're doing it manually in, in spreadsheets or the, whether they have a system like ours to know what, did I, what do I have sitting out there that's the highest priority. So I can make sure if I got a team member out, I can have another team member come in and pick up some of that slack. Um, <clears throat> pardon me, I got misclicked on a, misclicked on a cell. So Deb, I just, I was just thinking, um, you know, curious to your thoughts on how you would take some of this information, some of this planning processes and 
and, and um, relate them back to your risk mitigation planning. Yeah, Jeff, thanks. I mean, this is, this is a really great slide to look at where you're talking about allocating the, the work to, to um, show how you really can use that risk mitigation plan and how keeping it dynamic can be um, put into action as the plan may indicate that changes are needed in not only what the work is assigned and to who it's assigned to. So a good example is a, a local urology group who is doing 200 colonoscopies a day in my area just announced that they are going to be shut down until July. So what this means is that the staff who may have been assigned to more upstream tasks to get new claims out the door should be reassigned to work the existing inventory in those special projects because you're, you're, you're not going to have the volume of new claims coming in. So, so this, you know, this is just the speaking again to, you know, reviewing that plan, you know, things are happening very, very, very quickly. It's very dynamic and, and being ready and willing to adjust that plan and, and to make sure that your, your workforce is that, that they understand why you're asking them to do different things during, you know, during this crisis period. Yeah, that's a great point. That redundancy is key. And, I, and um, you know, as we're going to talk about a little bit later, um, you know, it goes beyond just having uh, the data about what work there is to do. Um, but once you've issued that work out to your team, uh, they need to have a mechanism for reporting back to you what they worked on. So in our tool, we track all that automatically. And you can see here in this screenshot, you know, over the course of a week, uh, this user, their productivity sort of ebbs and flows. Um, and it may mean because they work particular buckets of claims together, um, but having data back from your team, which you may never have had before, and after this is over, you're still going to want, understanding how your team works inside of the work is real, inside of the work plan that you've given them is really import, important. So getting that information back from them will give you a baseline of how much each one of your team members can work, um, what, what are their capabilities in terms of productivity, um, but also what impacts work trends. If they get a huge uh, adjustment back from, uh, you know, provider level adjustment or a huge capitation check back from a payer, uh, that may have to take their eyes off of other work. So that will help you understand how you compartmentalize the work from team member to team member. And getting this data and tracking it when you need to, when they're remote, when you can't see the people doing the work, but you want to feel, and they want to feel good and accountable about the fact that they're getting their work done and that they're achieving their productivity levels, this can help you create a, a cadence about productivity that maybe didn't exist before. Um, I've worked with a lot of people who, when you say, tell me all the things you're working on right now, they get very nervous and defensive. You know, it's sort of the old cliche from the movie Office Space when the consultants sit down and they want to ask you, you know, tell me what you do all day. That's a scary question, but it can be a different response um, to come back to uh, your manager to say, here's all I accomplished this week. I didn't get through 100% of what you assigned to me. I'm aware of what you assigned to me, and here's the 15% I couldn't get to and why. That would be every, I, I know as a manager, that would be my dream, that every one of my team members came to me and said, I'm aware of 100% of what you assigned. I only got to this percent. Here's why and here's what it is. And I haven't lost sight of any of it. So, Deb, I don't know if you have any input on this slide, um, but I wanted to talk about outcomes next. Um, yeah, I would, I would let you go forward and talk about outcomes. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, so, in terms of outcomes, this is sort of the third step, right? Create your plan. It's three or four steps. Create your plan, get that, allocate the work out to your team, know what you've allocated. This may happen to happen every week too. Um, and that's sort of where a system like ours comes into place where we're helping you automate it. But know what you've given your team members, give them a mechanism to tell you what they've worked and then in, in implement a mechanism to go back and audit some of the work they said they've completed. Uh, in this particular report, this is called a resolution tracking report. This would show a manager, and there's a red box around a couple of the employees that are redacted there down at the bottom left, that one employee, they'd worked about the same number of claims, but one has a resolution rate in the 70s, the other in the 30s. And so understanding not only that somebody is um, just pressing the resubmit button on the keyboard, right, and resubmitting claims, which may not be doing anything to get those claims paid, but they're actually taking an action to get that claim off of the AR and 
yield that claim for payment as much as possible. Um, so tracking, option, tracking outcomes gives you an enormous opportunity uh, to work together, to get your team working together. And it's really the, that last cornerstone of your, any plan. This is how you know your plan's working. Because I can work claims all day, but if I'm not getting them paid, I'm not helping. Uh, and the, the mission right now is to get as much paid as you can right now um, and to prepare your team for that sort of oncoming surge uh, that we're pretty sure is going to show up uh, when this, this fog lifts. So in terms of, uh, uh, so Deb, I was wondering if you could talk to us a little bit. I know you have some thoughts about um, other places where practices can be looking for revenue opportunities. Yeah, and so so we we know that those traditional revenue streams are de are declining, right? We we just know that. So I, I wanted to give everyone some other places to look for some unrecognized revenue. And and if you're if you're not actually practicing, if, if if you're a, a billing organization, I mean this is great advice that you can give to your practice management team um, partners, so that they can mine what I call mine for unrecognized revenue. So so. One of the one of the places that I would start looking is is to go upstream and utilize the system reporting to identify any unbilled revenue that that's sitting are out in the system. So these are um, you know encounters that actually occurred, um, but but there's no there's no revenue and no claims generated. So one is encounters with no charges. The other is pending charges in your EHR that haven't moved to your practice management system looking at your practice management system on bill, and also looking at your clearinghouse rejections that are on work. So, you know, just having someone eyeball those, take a look at those, monitor those, and, and you know, I, every single time I've done this, there, we've always found revenue in there. Um, and, and, and encounters and visits that can be pushed through and, and create cash. The other place, some of the other ideas I have is to engage coding experts to identify coding opportunities and prioritize them. And then also to leverage any existing or emerging revenue opportunities. And this is the telehealth, telemedicine, remote patient monitoring, all of these areas that, that um, you know, practices may, may have been doing and not, not creating claims for in the past. Um, and then certainly that, you know, now that that's becoming so prevalent that they have an opportunity to, to bill for those and making sure that they're, they're taking those up, um, taking advantage of those opportunities. Um, so now I'm going to turn it back to Jeff to summarize everything yeah. we talked about. Yeah, Deb, that was one of the other things. I just wanted to relate this back um, before we finish up here and take questions. I wanted to relate this back to something that you talked about. Um, you know, I'm actually getting stuff done at home. My wife loves it. There's so many projects I've been putting off. And now that I can get up from my basement office and go upstairs and be home, my commute time is gone. My time in the office is, is, is not, you know, existing anymore. I'm getting to these projects I couldn't get to before. And I think what you were talking about in terms of finding these other revenue opportunities really, really is a great tie back to what you were talking about in terms of the risk mitigation strategy. Because part of what you may be, what uh, practices might be experiencing is they can't do certain things that they were doing because those resources aren't there. So if you didn't have the time to do those things before, now might be the time to do some of those things that Deb, uh, you were recommending. Uh, so I, I really appreciate sort of how you, you tie that back up. And, and hopefully the one positive thing is that folks can do some cleanup um, in here. And again, that cleanup can mean cash. I think that's the goal to get cash to the practice. Um, so, you know, just some final thoughts. We talked today about, um, you know, number one, identify the risks of the practice so that leadership understands. That's just number one. People can't make decisions without data, reliable data. So identify um, what the risk is and, and create a plan to mitigate stressors on revenue. Um, empower your staff with new tools. Give your team this, you know, this is a, a great time to, to make some change in terms of communication and and uh, participation in the organization. And it seems counterintuitive that everybody would leave the office and it would be a great way to connect people. But I have to be honest, I've connected with people on the internet I haven't talked with in a long time. Uh, so it's, it's been strange to watch that happen. Track, create a plan and track your progress. Again, manually, whether it's spreadsheets, whether it's using the reporting your practice management system, if you're interested in hearing how our system 
automate that for you. We would love to talk to you about it. Get a plan and track your progress so that when you come out of this thing, you know that it worked. Um, and understand that this change could be long term. This is this is we don't know what the what the long term um, impacts on us all are going to be. So, Deb, if, if you don't have any other final thoughts there uh, that you wanted to add, I, I think we can open it up for questions. Or just wanted to let you see if you had any other final thoughts. Yeah, I think, you know, Jeff, just a final thought on this is, is around the plan and, you know, making sure that you don't just create the plan and then say, okay, that's the plan and then, and then, you know, expect nothing to change or that that's going to work for you in this situation. So, you know, having that sense of urgency, keeping your eye on the ball, you know, being, being willing to be agile and, and to get your whole workforce behind you by explaining why you need to be agile. I think I think those are some some really key things that are going to help people get through this this um, you know crisis period, and and to be able to to have a viable business and and that workforce that is are engaged and that you can count on um, for when when we do see the surge probably at the end of this year. Great point. Yeah, I re really appreciate it. So. With that, uh, Deb, I want to thank you again uh, for uh, joining as a panelist and, and, and um, offering your expertise to us and, and to the other attendees. And, um, you know, really do appreciate the time that you put into this. Um, MJ, I wanted to maybe hand it back to you for questions. Sure, Jeff, thanks. Yeah, we did get a few questions that came in. And just a reminder to folks, if you want to send either myself a chat or there's a Q&A module at the bottom, you can submit your question there. Uh, first question that came in, uh, it speaks about risk mitigation plans, Deb, I think this may be to you. It says, when creating a risk mitigation plan, how do I know how to prioritize my risks or how do we prioritize risks? Yeah, so, so that's a great question. Um, I, I think it's, it, it's, it's a discussion to, to understand, you know, to, to, to first to get those, the, the potential risks listed, right? And, and just to give you an example, if, if I were creating a risk mitigation plan um, in this environment, the, there, there are four things that I would say, these are, these are the four things I need to protect, right? It would be the health and safety of my teams. It would be the, to preserve the revenue and cash flow. It would to be remain compliant and last have a positive customer and business partner relationships. Right, so those those are the four kind of pillars of the things that I need to protect. And then once once I can identify, or my team, it's not one person. Once the team has identified, you know, what are those most important things that we can preserve? Then the next part of the conversation is, well, what are the what are the risks to those things? What are the things that could potentially impact that? Right, and and when you identify those those risks then you can say, all right, what, what are we going to do? What, what mechanisms or visibility are we going to put in place to, to A, either, you know, optimally to make sure that those things, those risks don't come to fruition, or B, to be able to have the visibility and to identify, if, you know, if, if, if something runs off the tracks, that you're going to quickly be able to identify that that happened and that you're going to be able to come up with with a, a plan of action to be able to to you know minimize the the negative impact on on those things that you are most important to you so that's what i would recommend for for creating and approaching that risk plan and then also how you prioritize that plan thanks deb uh we have a couple more that's come in so far uh this one jeff maybe to you because uh, we were just talking about this last week. It says, what is your next webinar topic? And it says, possibly telehealth slash telemedicine, question mark. Yeah, it's a pretty timely question. <laughs> uh, actually, telemedicine, or we're maybe going to start talking about remote medicine, is, one of, is the next webinar we're working on right now, uh, bringing in some uh, coding compliance and other experts to talk about that. Um, and so keep your eyes on your email, because we'll be uh, putting out some dates for that as soon as we can. Also, uh, for anybody who's interested, uh, we're going to be working on a very quick uh, webinar in the next few weeks for anybody who's interested to see more of a detailed dive in our application, our, you know, our, our software as a service, uh, and how we connect all of the, the moving parts of somebody's um, revenue cycle systems in one place. 
uh, to help them with that. So yeah, definitely keep your eyes on your email. If we went into your junk folder, dig us out of there and uh, we'll, we'll send out those new dates soon. I right, just one more so far, Jeff. Uh, it says, you mentioned these screenshots are from your product. Is that standalone or does it connect to the billing system? Yeah, we, we pull data in from a lot of different sources. So we pull data in from remittance data, uh, so from your clearing house, I should say, or uh, sometimes that data is available right on your network. Uh, we also pull in some reports or can connect directly to the practice management system. It sort of depends uh, where the practice or, or the, the revenue cycle firm is at. Um, but yeah, we do integrate with the existing systems. There's, uh, we try to leverage the tools that people already have uh, to give them visibility that, um, you know, that you're just not able to get out of your practice management system, especially around some of that productivity data. Uh, so yeah, appreciate that question. And that's all I've got for open questions, Jeff. Well, thanks, MJ. I appreciate you uh, running this for us again. Um, if you want to learn more about us, uh, feel free to send us an email at revenuehealthsystems.com or if you would like copies of the presentation or the link to the recording, uh, please send us an email. If you want to find uh, Crimmins and Associates, it's uh, crimmonsconsulting.com or you can email deb at deb at crimmonsconsulting.com. Otherwise, uh, Deb, thanks a lot. Appreciate your input and insight. Want to thanks every, thank everybody for attending. I uh, hope everybody uh, stays uh, healthy and happy and have a great day. All right. Thank you.